everyone, this is Freddy with Superbike Unlimited. I know it's been a really long time since you've seen me, and first and foremost, I apologize for that. Um, it's not that I didn't want to see you. I just had a lot going on, and there's been some changes that's uh, that have been going on around here. So first and foremost, I'll just do a quick catch up and kind of help you understand uh, why you haven't seen any of these videos. The, uh, the R1 is still here. Um, we're for sure still going full speed ahead. So last year I was asked to take over as crew chief for a BMW program that was Nolan Lampkin was riding that bike. And it was very time consuming because there was, it was a bit late and um, the bike came in late and there was a lot of work to be done like into the season. So I was forced to kind of just dive right in and work with those guys quite a bit to try to get them up and running, including us developing the bike and assembling it and all that stuff here at the shop. So um, that just took a tremendous amount of my time. And then probably around Laguna Seca around ish um, Tex uh, has basically decided to move on to a different uh, area of his life. He doesn't want to work on motorcycles anymore. He's essentially been doing it for a long time. It can be a stressful job and he's looking for something a little more relaxed and essentially retire from the motorcycle world. And I uh, said he wants motorcycles to be a hobby and not a job anymore. So obviously that changed things around here because he is kind of the guy that was doing everything. So, or a good chunk of it. Um, so, uh, that's where we are. We do have another tech here, somebody that you're going to meet in just a few minutes um, that I've met some time ago. He used to work for Westby Racing and managed a lot of the components of their Junior Cup program when they still did that. And uh, we're going to still bring on another guy. And um, so we're going to have two guys back here that were still the second person's yet to be decided. So um, we're still talking to people about that job. But uh, and then now I work for Westby. I'm taking over as their electronics engineer. Uh, data management and uh, engine strategy, electronic strategy, that kind of thing, engine management. Essentially going to be doing that for the season. So there's going to be probably less of my free time to do this stuff, but we're still going to make a serious effort to finish up all these builds. We've still got some really cool projects in the work, including the R1. And uh, we're going to go full tilt with the R1, some crazy stuff ahead. Naturally, I'm close, working even closer with Westby now, so we're going to have access to some special technical information and components. We're going to try to parallel a lot of things on our bike with theirs, just because, for one, it's going to make my job easier doing their electronics if I share some of those components. So we're going to get into that way later. we got to do everything in stages. We want to show you different options you can pursue as somebody who might own an R1. So first up, this video is actually going to be largely filmed last year. You're going to see a lot of stuff that you, Tex is in there, and uh, and then we're going to basically jump to now. So don't be confused when you see Tex in there. That's what's going on. Just wanted to give you that, that uh, intro, and we're going to get right to it. Hi everyone, this is Freddy with Superbike Unlimited, and today we're going to be doing the second update of our 2022 Yamaha YZF-R1 Superbike project. And today we're gonna be getting into some of the good stuff. We're gonna be installing some racing components and we're gonna be pursuing a few options to make more power on this thing. Obviously we know these bikes are a bit restricted from the factory, so we're gonna be testing a few solutions today and tomorrow that will um, improve that considerably. So we're gonna get right into it. We have uh, starting up a few components that we'll outline and uh, then we'll start installing them. All right, so first up, what we're gonna do is we're planning on, this is gonna be a super bike, so we're just gonna go ahead and start getting stuff out of the way so we don't have to basically purchase things twice, such as exhaust systems, or redo things later needlessly. So the first thing up that we have is gonna be one of these racing style oil pans. You'll notice the big difference here is that compared to the stock one, which we'll show you in a minute, this it's got this large, it's basically just a much deeper sump. and. Uh, this is something we see on some other bikes from the factory. Our Kawasaki, for example, kind of looks like this right out of the box. This is basically to improve oiling of the bottom end, especially supposed to improve crankshaft oiling and uh, minimize potential oil starvation risks in high braking zones and things like that. And um, the next thing that we're going to do is kind of along the same line is this. This is actually a World Superbike oil line. These are used by the factory teams. It's supposed to increase oil to the crankshaft. Sorry about that, the battery died as always, but the um, basically that this is a comprehensive kit. So when you get one of these, it comes with a whole bunch of supplementary components that allow you to do the install. So you don't need to buy anything else when you buy one of these. They are expensive. You're gonna for sure spend some money. I wanna say, I don't remember how much we paid for this, but it was several thousand dollars. It's, it's not cheap, but it's one of those things that if you want to run all the proper stuff on the bike, you have to have it in place. And especially if it might potentially improve engine longevity or durability or reliability, we're all for it. 
that being said, there's a lot of people out there that think these things have cranks that will just grenade if you look at the bike sideways. Um, and I'll be honest, we haven't seen that here. The uh, We've had a ton of R1s. I'm sure a lot of you guys have been following us for a while and know that we used to specialize in that bike almost exclusively several years ago. And we've had, I've never actually seen one of these exploding crank deals uh, on one of our customer bikes. We've had, uh, we have seen an engine failure that involved like bearings on the bottom end, one, and uh, that was an early 2015 model that had basically had a, a decent amount of race time on it and had not been serviced. But generally speaking, we've found these things to be very reliable. So this is just a kind of a precautionary measure. People are doing it at the factory. Those bikes are being revved a little bit higher than a standard R1. And there's obviously a lot more load on this engine with some of the supplementary components we're gonna be doing to increase horsepower. So, you know, I don't know that it's necessary, but we're just gonna do it. All right, so Tex has done a fine job of getting through all the boring stuff and uh, pulled off a lot of the stock crap that uh, was in the way. We're not going to bore you with that because it's the same when everyone does it. There's no, there's no secret there. The, uh, but we do want to show you basically the difference. Will you hold that other one up, Tex? The, um, you can kind of see there is a totally different design here. Obviously, it's on the actual, the, the deeper end of it is on the right side versus dead center on the original, and there's a, a much greater volume there. So that's naturally going to require a totally different exhaust design because the standard exhaust, this, the header actually splits this. Whereas on this, everything's going to be on this side here. Um, but yeah, so this is at least a way you can kind of have a visual representation. And if I take this here, you can kind of even see more, there's a lot more volume there. So that's kind of the idea. All right, so this kit does come with all the bolts you need to do the install, and they basically look like this guy. Actually, look at that. That one's even kind of rusty right out of the out of the bag. And uh, naturally, we don't want to use those. They're ugly, and they're heavy. So we're going to go ahead and use a bunch of our Zeta titanium bolts. Those are, I believe, M6x20s, and, uh, you know, a pretty standard bolt. So fortunately, we actually had all these in stock. And uh, we're just going to go ahead and sub those. And as we're getting to the rest, we're, we'll, we'll confirm if we have potentially interchangeable bolts. Here's some others that are going to be used. Any that it's suitable for us to swap the tie, we'll do so. We'll do a weigh-in right now. The other one's still got some oil on it, so we're going to let that drain off, and then we'll clean it. But the new pan weighs 1,181 grams. All right, so Tex has in place most of this assembly other than the actual pan. You can see that, uh, what's, what's the name of this, Tex? This is the pickup, and then this is the breeder. Okay, so this is all basically new to accommodate this new uh, sump design. You can see some of the old parts here. Um, but all, I mean, pretty straightforward getting that in? Uh, pretty straightforward. It, it does go in a little bit different than, uh, than what this does because it moves it over to this side. The one piece that was tricky was this bracket here i don't know if you can see it that well but it does bolt in you replace this pipe as part of the kit and this bracket bolts in when you when you install that pipe so it can secure this okay all right and then now we're going to put this guy on mm -hmm. okay all right so it does come with a brand new drain plug naturally this being steel we don't really want to use it. And plus, they're, these are kind of a pain in the ass to drill. You know, you have to kind of go through the side of it there. Um, so we're going to use one of our Pro Bolt titanium drain plugs. These are great, cost-effective way to easily add safety wire. And you have something that's uh, it's lighter. Looks like we had about six grams there. Yeah, seven grams. Not too bad. So we're going to pop that guy on. Note that that does have a little bit less thread engagement, as we just observed but still more than enough. All right, so here you can see this World SBK fuel line installed, and I want to apologize because I've not been filming all this. We're slammed here at the shop, so I will say, you know, this video, I'm trying my best to show you everything, but I keep having to step away to take care of other things. The, uh, basically this replaces these components, and Tex, is there anything you'd like to say about this? Essentially, obviously I didn't film one bit of it, so. Um, well, basically to get to this back here, you're gonna have to take this, uh, this coolant pipe off. What I did was I just unbolted it here, unbolted the bracket for it here, and then just kind of moved it out of the way to get to it. But it's okay. And this, from your, from a mechanical perspective, is it pretty clear, like, how this thing works? 
Yeah, I mean, basically, you just got a straight shot oil line, probably a larger ID than what this is. And instead of taking this somewhat circuitous route to get there, it just replaces that. Okay. Probably runs a little cooler as well. Great. And that's just one of these things that we've been told is essential for ensuring longevity on a proper SBK motor where everything's going to have a bit more stress on it. So that's exactly what we're using this. I want to add, this was not cheap. I think these are around six or 700 bucks, which seems crazy for what it is. But on the flip side, if it makes our motor either run better or potentially last longer, that's a, it's a, it's a, an expense that's uh, well-deserved. All right. So here's the weigh-in comparison. So the old pan lighter, not surprised given the fact that the new one is uh, much bigger and probably a bit more robust as our pal Chuck Giacchetto would say. Um, but yeah, that's a, it's a good, I think the other one was around 1100. So we're, we're 300 grams heavier. Um, not bad, all things considered. So moving on, um, the next thing we're going to do is install an exhaust system. I want to comment that this is likely not going to be our long-term exhaust. We do have to use something that's going to be specific to the configuration. Some of the, not just the oil pan, but some other things that we're going to be using on the motorcycle that will directly impact uh, motorcycle exhaust fitment. So we've got for now this SBK spec Graves full system. Presumably this is something like what would have been used on the uh, the factory Yamaha USA program prior to attack taking over. This is, you know, something you might have seen on Cameron's bike or something like that. But we got a hold of this guy. I'm sure it's a great performer. This is what we're going to start off with. And you can see the unique header routing that's designed to accommodate the, uh, the oil pan. So that's going to go on. And that's going to be, like I say, if nothing else, something that will run initially. We do need to get some springs. Probably during testing, we'll just throw some safety wire on there. We're missing a few. But uh, this will at least get us by while we're doing some of our development. All right, so Tex is chipping away at this, and we've had to do some small adjustments already. This is a superbike exhaust. That is not a superbike radiator or oil cooler. So Tex has had to use some spacers. You can see one. I'm going to adjust the camera here. Right in there, you can kind of see. Yeah, you can see that spacer right there is not standard. We're using that because Tex saw that we had some clearance issues. And there's another one just, let's see if we can get under there right there all that's just allowing this to, to stay clear of the exhaust we didn't want it touching so texas that's the simplest way for us to do that and this does not need to be perfect because again this is a super bike this is this is not permanent we're not going to use these forever we're probably we might not even ride with this stuff it depends on when some of our other parts get here but we're we just need to be able to test on the dyno and maybe on the racetrack temporarily like this so right now uh we've got the first half done texas is now going to start fitting the rear half of this exhaust and we did find this pipe's got a little ding in it on the side here so the um you know this is something that if any of you guys notice this is obviously a used exhaust system and it's going to work fine for our purposes um but long term again i think we're going to have some other stuff and it'll be interesting to see what other exhausts we use how they stack up compared to this guy in the dyno Stock bracket actually works with the uh, on the rear sets kit. That is a pleasant surprise. We were fully expecting to have to make something for that, but Graves, honestly, that's one thing I've always, unless it's absolutely necessary, it's so nice when people make a system that that retains OE mounting points like that because it just simplifies it for everybody else. You know, you don't have to make all these custom brackets if you're using an aftermarket rear sets kit. You don't have to request that that manufacturer make you some oddball bracket. Some companies are really good about that, like Evol Technology. They're really awesome because a lot of the, the, you know, they make a rear sets kit and they might make 15 different brackets for everybody's exhaust, but a lot of companies are not so accommodating and you might have to come up with your own solution that may or may not be as rigid or even as pleasing to the eye as something that's going to come with something like an Evol kit. Hi everyone. Okay, so we're uh, picking back up on this thing. It's been a couple of days since we started um, doing some work on this that you last saw. Tex did confirm that while this is close, it's not quite. The uh, 
we were able to secure this to the OE style mounting bracket. However, when doing so, it basically put the exhaust at an angle, maybe something like that. And in doing that, it, it put this junction down here at a really odd angle right here. It put, uh, basically it created a, a gap in, in that connection. So we're not gonna be able to use that OE style bracket. Not really an issue because as I mentioned, we're going to a different rear set anyway. And Steve from Evolve Technology, who is the designer of those components, um, is really accommodating and generally speaking, wants his rear sets to be as adaptable as possible to basically any configuration. And um, so we'll be able to get the correct bracket. It's not an issue. We might have to provide some dimensions because this is an unusual exhaust, but not worried about it. So what we're going to be doing today is uh, some of the stuff you guys have been looking forward to. We're going to try and get some, some uh, power uh, upgrades done in the terms of electronics specifically. And then we have a whole plethora of stuff we're going to have to start working on. So yeah, we got a lot to work through. Um, what we're going to do first, um, I have to, do some stuff on my end to get ready for this uh, tuning aspect, but we're gonna what we're gonna do in the interim is we're gonna go ahead and put on our amazing Evolve Technology rear sets kit. And for those, I mean, most of you guys, we've been using these for a long time now. So if you've been following our channel, you you know about this product, and you probably know about it anyway. But this is something, and actually, you can see here, this is we've got two brackets that have already been provided that we're going to be able to test. This is what we love about Evol. Now, keep in mind, you're not going to get these for free. You have to pay for this stuff, but it's just nice because so many manufacturers don't even do that. So it's just one of those things that it makes a difference. Um, there's a lot of brands out there that we like. We're just this is one of the, our core brands that we always use for a given build. So. This is uh, basically what we're seeing here is a complete kit. You know, it's got the return spring, shift rod, all the stuff that you need to mount this thing up. Um, this kit does eliminate the side stand in this configuration because this is obviously going to be a race bike. So you'll see how that works, but um, you can retain the side stand should you choose to. This is a track only version. If you have a street bike, it's not a problem to keep the, the side stand. Um, and some of the things that I'll say that we really like about these, they hold up really well in a crash. Um, you can see where there's an engineered failure point here. So if you do crash, generally what happens is you snap this off and then this stays. And something else that I'm really fond of with these rear sets is this unique peg design. What you get here is more surface area for your boot to grip onto. And the net result is that you wind up not killing your boot so fast. Another rear set that I really like is attack performance. That's to me, that's Evol and attack are the two that we have always found to kind of have a very high standard for both aesthetics and performance on the racetrack. And um, one thing, and I think most of you guys have seen this it, with attack performance rear sets, they use a very small peg that's very grippy and it absolutely wrecks your boots because you have a much smaller contact point that's there's a high level of adhesion right there but it's concentrated in a very small area. So you wind up usually right about there, you'll wear a hole in your boot. And uh, you know, it's something that your the boots don't last forever, but I've noticed that they do go a lot quicker when you're using those rear sets. So it's just one of those things. It's a small complaint, but it is a real thing. So with these, we don't find that issue and we still have a ton of support, lots of grip. So. Um, that's uh, something that's for me, a huge pet peeve is when I ride a motorcycle and I try to load my foot on the foot peg and I find that the, the peg isn't grippy enough and my foot wants to move or slide. I hate the way that feels it to me. It's, it makes it almost impossible to focus on riding the bike the way you want to, cause you can't load the chassis with your feet. So you don't have that problem with these. All right. So next, what we're going to do is uh, start taking this stuff off and we'll put them on. Um, uh, I won't bore you with that entire process. It's super easy. You cannot screw it up. Um, and then we'll uh, we'll start with some of the, the power upgrade side. All right, so we've had a small change of plans because um, this actually does have some, some revisions. The 2282R1 has an ECU protocol that's slightly different from prior years. And for the sake of speed, we're not gonna proceed with flashing this just yet. We're gonna have to use a customer bike basically later on down the road. So we'll still touch back on that, probably not in this build series, but we'll keep you updated. However, we want to get this thing rolling along and that's been holding us up because we're, there's a, some work to be done. 
Um, so the next thing we're gonna do is we're just gonna start stripping this thing down, which is what you can see Tech's doing now. And we're gonna start putting on some of the good stuff. We've got a lot of parts that we have to put on um, and kind of a small amount of time. So we're really gonna be hammering down. Um, so I'm gonna start laying some stuff out and showing what, what we have to put on. So right now Tex is just slowly removing all the OEM stuff. We're basically gonna, I mean, largely remove most of the, essentially almost all the electronic components, the uh, ABS system's gonna be removed. Um, and in doing that, of course, we're gonna be replacing everything with an upgraded counterpart. So in this case, we, I don't have the brake line set out yet, but we're gonna be you know, going a full ABS delete kit. And something else that we're gonna do right away is install a suitor clutch. Obviously, if you guys follow us, you'll know that this is something that we do on everything. They just make the bike easier to ride, especially on uh, uh, corner entry, hard braking, trail braking. It's, it, it really helps to settle the motorcycle and make it feel planted um, when you're pushing the thing into a corner. So in doing that, we're also going to use some GYTR reusable gaskets. These are available through Attack Performance if you want to buy some of your own. They're pretty inexpensive. They're nice because, you, you know, you want to pop this um this cover typically in a race weekend you're going to take this thing off a few times to check and replace plates as needed so definitely want to have a couple of these laying around and um next after tex gets done with uh his stripping of practically everything you see there we're going to start um with installing some of the goodies so tex is now about to start pulling off the essentially the whole front end and the reason for that is that Essentially, we're not going to use any of this stuff. We're going to be replacing the uh, every aspect of what's mounted to this front end, from the fork to the front wheel, brake discs, which we don't have yet, calipers, uh, brake lines, of course, since we're going to ABS, all hand controls. Um, there is some stuff we're going to keep initially, such as the throttle. Um, we are going to be using this. Uh, we are going to test an alternative throttle, but. Uh, this will be retained, although we're going to change some aspects of it, which we'll go into that in a bit. So gives us a clean slate. We've still got a little work to do because we're gonna have to swap out some stuff in here. Um, and we'll show you some information on that now. Okay, so what I'm gonna show you here, and as you can see, Tex has really been just tearing this thing off. And basically what, uh, I was about to make a joke about him basically just ripping this thing apart, but I don't want that to be uh, taken literally. It's a pretty painstaking process taking all this OEM stuff off because there's a lot packed into a tight space. Any of you who have done this kind of job, you'll know. We're not documenting all of it because it's boring and anyone can really do this. You just need to take your time, be careful, try not to break any tabs or connectors. Some of those, those OEM connectors are kind of a pain in the ass to get apart. Just take your, take your time, you'll be fine. So we are gonna show you, as you can see, the loom is, is almost completely removed. We're gonna show you the process of installing and replacing that with the, the kit loom, which is what we're gonna start off with before we use our long-term electronic solution. But before I get too far off topic, we were talking about the front end. So we're gonna be using, we're gonna be testing a bunch of different triple clamp options with this bike. Um, one of the first ones that we're gonna be using are these Evol technology clamps. And these are basically a, an, an option for the R1. So these are, when I say that, what I mean is that's not the standard Evol technology clamp, that's the stiffer version, which you requested because of the fork that we're planning on using has a bit of flex in it. So. You don't necessarily want the whole front end to have a tremendous amount of flex because it can cause some weird feel and strange handling dynamics. So you either generally want to have a clamp that has a certain amount of flex and then a stiffer fork or, or vice versa. And I mean, obviously these are, there's a lot of variables there, but that's just kind of a general concept that, that we're trying to adhere to. Um, so this clamp actually uses a totally different size stem. You may notice, it's actually probably hard to tell, but you can see here that that bearing's a lot smaller than a normal R1 bearing, and the stem is smaller as well. 
The reason for that is because we have some cups right here. And I've got these turned upside down so you can't see what they say. And actually, this is not all of them. This is just a couple of examples. But basically what these, uh, the purpose of these is they allow you to, when you press them into the steering head, you can adjust rake or offset. Offset meaning, um, essentially, if we were doing a rake adjustment, we would have a cup that is gonna be at a different angle at the top versus the bottom, so that, you know, if you're looking at the motorcycle, if this, you know, we can, we can start to angle the forks this way or this way. And these adjustments can be made in really small increments. Typically, it's done in half a degree increments, but you can even go more finite if you're looking for something, uh, you know, maybe a, a smaller adjustment. And obviously, just to make this cl as clear as possible to anybody who may be watching, the final rake is going to be determined by the chassis setup, the you know the height of the shock, the swing arm length, um, the relative fork height in the bike. Obviously, so if we, you know, if this bike has a 20, I don't remember what the stock rake on it is, but say it's 25 degrees, and we put a, a set of cups in there that change it by one degree, um, and say that bumps it up to 26 degrees or down to 24 degrees, obviously that's just static rake value of the chassis. The rake on the ground is gonna be totally different because it has everything to do with those relative ride heights, wheel bases, and things like that. So just something to keep in mind when we're talking about this stuff. Um, but anyway, so what we're gonna do, um, and when I was talking about offset, what that basically means is, so say you've got a set rake, you can actually move the, the steering stem fore and aft inside the steering head at a, at a set rake. So you could actually move the whole assembly fore or aft a certain number of millimeters um, this directly impacts trail and also you can affect the, the way the tire is loaded by doing that so um, we're not going to say which ones we're going to be using um, that's part of the development process and uh, you know we're not going to get too specific with that for obvious reasons but i just want you to understand that's why we're using this particular setup there are other manufacturers that make a triple clamp setup like this um, again this is the one we're going to start off with and i'll show you what the more flexible top clamp looks like for this triple clamp set as well, just so you can have an idea. But basically, it, this is the difference, is this top clamp is much stiffer. So moving on over here, what Tech is about to do is essentially remove this entire unit. Um, there is, there might be some stuff that we have to, yeah, there's definitely some stuff we're gonna have to rob out of yeah, here. I we just pull this off and take it out. Yeah, so we're gonna need the IMU and some other odds and ends back here. But basically, Tex is just gonna take off all of this OEM loom because we're going to be using the GYTR, formerly known as YEC, kit harness. Um, it's for racing use only. It cannot be used on a road bike. It comes with a, an accompanying ECU set. We've got a bunch of brackets and other odds and ends to complete installation, but we're going to use a, a non-standard subframe. Um, there's really nothing wrong with the stock, stock subframe. They just don't crash very well and they're kind of expensive, but it's actually a decent unit. Um, we're just gonna go with the moto holders because I like them. Um, they crash better, they're easier to repair, and they're much less expensive than the stock subframe if you happen to smash one up and you need to replace it. Um, so once uh, we get this off, we can strip out what we need from it and, uh, and begin the process of converting over to the GYTR electronics. All right, so for the back end of the motorcycle, Tex is mocking up a set of these, or excuse me, this moto holder subframe. Something to point out, this does retain the OE shouldered collar unit here, and that's, otherwise, you're gonna, essentially, it's not gonna be the right size for this, this mounting point here. You can see where it kind of necks it down. Um, it's important that you retain that. Something else that we're gonna have to do is, you can probably tell, we hold up that subframe real quick? It's obviously completely open on the bottom there. You flip it 90 degrees. So that's something to consider that we might have to make like a carbon tray or something like that, which we have around here some sheets of different materials. So it would be pretty easy to come up with a solution, um, but we're gonna just have to mock this up and see. That's one thing to consider with using a piece like this versus the stock subframe is it's much more enclosed on the bottom. So you may have to come up with a solution or have something where the bodywork is holding up the stuff. I don't really want to do it that way, so we'll probably make a little tray of sorts, but um, just a consideration. All right, so as you can see, Tex has got the clutch cover pulled out, and then he has gone ahead and removed the clutch assembly, which you can see here. 
we're gonna go ahead and use the suitor and what we're gonna do is we're gonna start sorry for the a little bit of clutter there the uh, we're gonna start with the standard setting that it comes with so this is the document that you get with your suitor actually this both of these documents and this has a lot of critical information um, we have stack height here this is a spec that we have to uh, adhere to and then we have ramp angle here which is something that you can determine by looking at this part of your diagram and this basically determines the final bit of setup we'll have text go into that in a bit um, but uh, what I was referring to in terms of the springs th these clutches come with an array of springs you have a main spring here 1500 Newton and then there's three springs that are provided as shown there and typically the median spring is going to be installed in the clutch as you can see here this comes with an 1100 a 1300 and a 1500 the 1300 is highlighted meaning that's the one that's installed in the assembly we're going to start with that um, the reason for that is uh, generally speaking they come with a uh, factory tested configuration that's going to work well the other thing is uh, normally when we pop these in we're going to put a new set of oem clutch plates in there we do not use aftermarket clutch plates on anything we always go oem uh, in this case these are brand new there's no reason to waste money buying a new set um, so we'll buy some some spares but you know since we're doing this install on basically a showroom new motorcycle we're just going to retain the stock uh plate set something else to point out uh when you do this it comes with another uh steel plate all right that you replace and it has to be the last one in the stack the last steel the last steel the last steel that you put in the clutch so the very last one that goes out the very end and the reason they do that is because the oem plate setup has a bigger id on the last plate that fits into the, the the stock pressure plate this one will not fit on the suitor clutch so you have to make sure that you swap it out with the provided plate that does fit otherwise you could cause some damage there awesome thank you Texas preparing to get this clutch put in and you can see we have a clutch holding tool this is really helpful for these um, something else i was just going to comment is we do have our exhaust bracket from steve that's going to work for this super super bike exhaust and also with us installing the subframe we've opted to replace the oem bolts with some zeta titanium units just to save a, a bit of weight since those are those are m10s aren't they yes. so those are pretty heavy chunky bolts since it's a, a 10 millimeter unit you can save a pretty good amount of weight by doing that probably about a quarter of a pound Okay, so Tex is going to walk you through the final stage of setting up your suitor. Okay, so once you get everything installed and you get your stack height correct and you get your pressure plate installed, you install five of your six bolts and then you leave one out. And then what you're going to do is you're going to measure the depth of this. And that, what that determines is this gap right here. And that gap controls how much the mechanism opens when it's slipping. So they give you a bushing and this is exactly 10 millimeters long so what you do is you put this over your tool and that gives you a flat surface to measure against and then you just bottom it out and we've got 36.93 there so punch in 36.9 on our calculator we're going to subtract the distance of the spacer so that's 10 millimeters leaves us 26.9 so then we're going to subtract the length of the bolt, which is 25 millimeters. And that gives us a gap of 1.9. Obviously, we need to close that up. And you say that because of? Because of where if you have the 32 milli or 32.5 degree ramp, ramp in there, and you go over here, and this is in German, but they do have it in English as well, but your, your target gap is one to 1.2 millimeters. And we've got 1.9, so obviously we need to reduce that. And then how do you go about that? Uh, reduce that by basically adding or subtracting the shims under the head of the bolt. And what that does is that makes the bolt sit higher and it opens that gap up and lets, and lets you control the, the distance of that gap. Although one thing to remember is even after you put shims in, keep in mind that the measurement that I just made is not going to change no matter what shims are in there. So you just have to, you know, double, triple check your measurements, double, triple check your math, 
and then you know you'll know that you have the gap that you need all right so texas is about to put this back on and i also wanted to tell you the um uh we've got this gasket another benefit of this is you know a lot of you know about with head gaskets you can put different thicknesses in we do the same thing here it increases your oil compression um it's a great way to increase uh <laughs> Tex, Tex just screwed me up. I was just, Didn't I was, do it, man. I couldn't keep a straight face. I was trying to trying to uh, be funny, but Tex you got a warm me when you do that stuff. Messed up the joke, but yeah, I was, I was just kidding. There's there's nothing in that, but other than reusability. What he's doing is basically, you want to try to clock that, what do you call the piece that sticks out, Tex? Uh, lifter arm, lifter peg. I mean, just, it's got to, it's got to engage with the, the splines on this, but then you also have to make sure that it's on the correct spline so that this is clocked at the right angle so you get a good clutch pull. So, where it's pointed at. And sometimes it takes a couple of tries. So, cool. right, so Tex is currently just applying some heat to this uh, bearing cup that we've pressed into the uh, steering head. Um, this is something that these have scribe marks on them, so you want to make sure you take some measurements of the steering head to try to get this as centered as possible. Some of these cup products, like on the Kawasaki, where they offer an OEM, or I should say a Kawasaki-provided uh, kit racing steering head cup that does this same thing, they're guides that make it impossible to basically screw it up. In this case, you could totally screw it up, so you have to take some measurements to ensure that you do it correctly. Tex is just doing this to try to make it a little bit easier to slide this race in. All right, sorry about that. So what I was saying is Tex, basically what he was doing is he he placed the actual race that goes in this cup in the freezer. It, it doesn't, it's not going to make a world of difference, but it can make this slightly, and I mean very slightly easier. Um, it'd probably be nice if we had some kind of liquid nitrogen and, a, and used a blowtorch for a more extreme uh, delta, but it's just one of those things that can make it go in. It still should only take a few minutes, and you want to have some tools like these drivers that we use. This can really simplify the process and make it, easier to to get everything we use that one to get it down flat with the cup and then we use one that's the size of the actual id of the cup to, to finish it all right so texas got this in place and uh we are gonna shortly pop some forks in here um we're gonna start off using our we have a set of world superbike forks that uh if you'll show us those this is these are basically a set of 2018 spec world superbike forks from Olin's. These are kind of uh, not available to the public. A very special fork that has tuned flex and uh, a pressurized sp um, spring cartridge on the inside. So this doesn't use gas, it uses a spring pressure system similar to FKR. We're gonna use those. And uh, I was gonna say, we've got some steering stops we're gonna put on there. Um, this is a steering stop option that we use, Tex has here in his hand. These are nice because um, they don't require you to permanently modify anything. And they're uh, uh, they're adjustable in terms of your your um, steering limitations very easily. So we're gonna go ahead and pop these on, and then we'll we'll show you what they look like mocked up. All right, so we've got this all sort of mocked up. We've got our ET clip-ons. You can see what the uh, the clamp looks like. Um, we have our forks in place. The uh, you know, you can get a pretty good idea of, of the starting point here. Obviously there's a lot of work to do, but this is uh, this is a good place to be. We're, we're starting to get something that resembles a motorcycle and then we can, we're gonna start bolting on this other stuff. The next bit we have uh, on the front end here is this Moto Holders carbon fiber intake duct. This is specific to the 2020 and it's got an aluminum um, dash support and stay that's gonna go on top of it. That can be seen here. So we're gonna go ahead and, and, and put this stuff on. Okay, here you can see the front end of the bike. We've got a few things that we may wind up swapping out. There's some components that we haven't yet received that we may later move to. 
Um, there's actually a lot of stuff that we have kind of, like I mentioned in the works on this thing. But for now, you can see the kind of configuration. We've already gone over some of this, of course, but just to recap, we've got our custom Evo technology, stiff option Superbike clamps. We've got our RVP 25 Superbike forks. Um, this is a previous generation World Superbike fork. Still the same basic damping technology that's in the current system, just a slightly different diameter on the rebound side and uh, a totally different lower fork design. So you can see we've got some other changes here. We don't have a Superbike Electronics package yet, and we're really still kind of discussing which way we're gonna go with that. We do have some complications, largely due to supply chain. You know, chip shortages are, are having a big impact on what's available. <clears throat> it's not even just chip shortages. We're seeing display shortages, all kinds of stuff. So there's a lot of things that are kind of hindering our ability to, to equip this bike as we would like to. And there are more than one option, and they're both have a hindrance, shall we say. Um, so uh we're not sure where we're gonna end up there i have some idea um and i just think it's gonna take some time but just to get the bike rolling i've, I've probably already discussed this and i'm sorry because again if it's been about a month since we touched this bike so um i don't mean to repeat myself if i've already covered this but we uh are going to be running yamaha's kit stuff gytr um and i think i did mention that because i remember somebody commenting something about uh this compared to a certain superbike system i'm going to go into that in a minute but Tex has gone ahead and got the harness over here. It, when you buy a complete one of these kits, there's a whole package that you can essentially buy. Um, it comes with a bunch of hardware and stuff, including an ECU mount, uh, a rectifier and regulator mount, a bunch of little brackets and odds and ends and things, just to try to make the, the installation as turnkey as it can be. So it's really nice. Obviously, we're gonna swap out some of these fasteners and stuff. We're just mocking everything up. But um, this is that's the nice thing about when you do a system like this is, Superbike systems are, are very complicated and difficult to install and set up. They typically require a custom loom to be made, et cetera, et cetera. If you go there and, and configuring it is a whole other thing. Um, with these systems, it comes plug and play. It comes with a, a base map that's going to usually be pretty damn good right out of the box. And it, it's hard to screw it up. You know, I mean, you can if you really are just doing wild things in the software, but they're almost designed to be dummy proof because they don't want something that's overcomplicated and is a burden to the user so what i do want to mention is somebody commented in one of our videos so it must have been the last one where i mentioned that we were going to use some kit stuff until we got our superbike systems that the new gytr ecu was as good as a motec ecu or something like that it's not and i mean it's just that simple the reason for that is because it's still really locked down there are with every evolution every new year an update comes out and sometimes there are new tables that are added, there are new strategies that are introduced, and there may just be base things that are updated on the back end that we can't even see because so much of what is done on these ECUs is completely hidden and locked away from the user. Certain direct values, normally what we're changing is offsets or percentages and things like that in the software. We don't actually see direct numbers on most of those things, say like ignition timing or uh, drive-by-wire values and torque mapping and stuff. It's all, we have to just read the manual and, and kind of just do our own testing and stuff. Ignition timing has been locked on these for a while. I haven't looked at the software in this ECU we're about to test. But I want to say, it's not fair to compare a system like this to MoTeC and it shouldn't be held to the same standard because it costs a fraction of the price. It's vastly easier to use, but it's also vastly less complicated and capable for that reason. We can do sectoring. We have exact control over every single value on a superbike ecu we, we see what they are they're literal values and um in most cases with motec uh other ecus it may be different um but it's just not a fair comparison you can't it's it's not reasonable to expect this thing to to compete with a, a motec ecu for some guys it will because motec's hard to configure and it's easy to screw it up i'll just i'll just say that i've looked at plenty of ecu packages some configured by people who are professionals and some of the values that I saw were less than desirable. They, they netted end results that would make a bike that's hard to ride um, and didn't necessarily have some of the safety strategies and things like that that allow a rider to push and be comfortable lap after lap. Um, so at the end of the day, that's a big factor. The calibration on a Superbike ECU uh, has a big impact on how good or bad it might be. Um, but at the end of the day, perfectly calibrated MoTeC system versus perfectly calibrated GYTR, it's not even close. I mean. We have we can make the Motec system perfect. We we could come so close to perfection, and with this, there's always going to be compromises. It's just not set up that way. 
So just something I want to comment on. I'm not going to drone on and on about it forever, but I just want to make that clear to anybody. They're not the same. They should never be considered the same. That's the reason why one costs way more. There's not people running, you know, and even an Australian Superbike. Now you can run a Motec ECU. It's an open option, probably because Motec is actually an Australian product and they they want that in their domestic series. And the guys that are switching, they're immediately finding pace. So it's just a clear indicator. So moving on, we're going to go ahead and uh, Texas is about to wrap up the install of these discs. I'll go over here so we can have a look at these guys. They're already looking pretty sharp. And this is something we use factory torque specs on these. Is that right? Correct. And that was 17 Newtons? 17 Newtons. Yeah, so we're just using a little bit of blue Loctite and then we torque these to spec. And then we'll be able to, to mock this guy up and confirm our fitment. Should be pretty spot on. Then we have to sort out, um, we're going to have to confirm some other things. At that point, we're using a, a different offset brake caliper. I think we've talked about this already. We're using these buttes here. This is a Brembo evo which is a monoblock world superbike spec caliper probably ought to wash that up a little bit before we throw her on but <laughs> we just pulled it off the ducati yeah this has been scavenged from the v4 which in case you haven't gathered she's gone it's not going to be here much longer we've still got the motorcycle and i know this is going to be a heartbreak for some of you guys because as much as we'd like to keep all these things forever we just can't do it um but so we're stealing everything off the v4 um that we can use on the yamaha but yeah this is kind of a sad sight but that's the old uh the SBU V4 right now, and she'll be reverted back to stock trim at some point and then sold. But uh, anyway, we're going to be using this brake disc, or excuse me, this brake caliper. This has a, a unique offset that's about, I believe, a millimeter and a half different from most standard calipers. For that reason, we may have to create custom spacers to go back behind these, these discs. As we, you've seen on every other build we've done, we typically have to do something like that. We won't know until we mock it up. We could do some math, but we're just going to do it the regular way. Um, and we'll know that in just a minute. All right, so I think you're pretty well caught up. We've got almost everything covered in that first video to now. There's a little bit of uh, continuity uh, and discrepancy there because of the fact that we did fit everything up. You can see some of our components here. Um, just test fitted, you know, not, we still haven't designed our brake line kit or anything like that, but made it a little bit further than what you saw, but that's largely everything, so. This next one, we're gonna get into some electronic components. And I'm sorry, I saw this video is like 45 minutes long. So sorry about that, but it's a lot to cover and it wouldn't have made sense to break it up into two videos given how much time has passed. So next one's gonna be really cool. Gonna step into the data world of things and use some consumer level stuff that we offer. It's really good and affordable. So make sure you tune in for that one. But I think that's gonna do it for this one. Thanks so much for watching. Again, really sorry for the long wait, but thank you for sticking with us. Be sure to like this video and comment below. Let us know if you wanna see something specific in the next one, and we'll see you in the next one. Thanks.